Welcome to this workshop video, Dosage Calculations, Practical Information for Students, brought to you by the Student Success Commons at York County Community College. So in this video, we're going to touch on the following topics. We'll look at top tips for succeeding when math is involved, the metric system, must-know math, problem types, problem-solving methods, and problem solving steps and action. At the end of the video, we're going to go through several problems together that are similar to ones you may see on homework or quizzes or tests, and we'll go through how to solve them. So the first thing I want to touch on is top tips for success with math. I know a lot of people find math intimidating or unpleasant, um, but these these three top tips should help should help you out. So the first tip is practice a lot more than you may think you need to. It takes a lot of practice to become comfortable with the calculations you'll be asked to do. Try practicing a little each day. You can repeat the same problems again and again, especially the ones that have tripped you up. And as you practice, try to rely on your notes less and less to ensure the information is really sticking. Don't be afraid to work backwards. Uh, take a problem apart, put it back together in a way that makes sense to you. Maybe you start by looking at the answer and then trying to figure out, okay, this is how they got there, and you, you work your way back to the question. Um, if you're given example problems in your textbook or during a lecture, take the time to practice these on your own. You can never run out of practice problems, and it's only going to make you better for it. Tip two, make sure you employ good study techniques. So struggling on one problem for 90 minutes is not what I mean when I say practice a lot. If ever you're working on a problem and you can't make any progress after 15 or 10 minutes, just please take a break. Just get up and move, do some stretching, you can move on to another problem, go for a short walk, take a drink, work on some other homework, water your plants, just something else. Uh, just put a pin in that question and come back to it later. We all only have 24 hours in a day, so it's best not to spend too much time by spinning your wheels on just one question. In fact, you're actually maybe doing more harm than good with this method. So if you do get stumped, as we all do, just pause on that question, move on to another one, seek some help, come back to it later. Another good study practice is to utilize your notes less and less. I touched on that earlier. You, want, you really want to try to embed the information into your mind to the point where you don't even need to review your notes. This does take time and perseverance. And it requires not just memorizing material, but understanding it. And so by putting it the, the information into your own words, whenever possible, this is going to help it really stick. Studying a little bit each day is important. I did touch on that too. Um, it doesn't sound like fun. I'm not saying you have to study for two solid hours each day. Even just a couple minutes each day can be helpful in increasing your efficiency and your confidence. And remember, you, you need to use whatever study time you have wisely. So this does not include wasting away on one or two problems that make you feel like your brain is melting. Which brings me to our third point, our third study tip, or math tip, I guess. Um, look for help. So when you do come across problems or concepts that stop in your tracks, look for help. Don't don't sit there for 90 minutes pulling your hair out. Go back and reread relevant textbook passages. Look at notes from your teacher for your class. Try to break the problem down. Look at it from a different perspective so you can find a similar problem and figure out how that one was solved. You can search the SSE's resources for something that can help guide you. You can reach out to your teacher or your instructor. There are plenty of things you can do um, if, you, if you need help. And keeping all of these tips in mind will surely benefit you whenever math is involved. Let's take a quick look at the metric system. You're going to see the metric system used in a lot of your problems. We're going to see milligrams and milliliters and grams and kilograms. That comes up a lot, and that's all met metric system units. So. Um, the metric system is used extensively in the sciences, which includes medical fields. It is a decimal system based on the power of 10. The basic units of measure used in dosage calculations include the gram, which we represent with a G or GM, that measures weight, liter, which is capital L, that measures volume, and meter for length. You probably won't use meter too, too much in dosage calcs. Um, Prefixes such as micro, milli, centi, and kilo indicate the size of the units in powers of 10 of the base unit. So for instance, kilo stands for thousands, milli stands for one thousandths, and centi stands for one hundredths. Uh, because conversion 
between degrees of magnitude always involves multiplying by a power of 10. Converting from one magnitude to the other is actually really quite easy. It may not sound it from this description, but we do have a nice detailed video all about the metric system showing you several examples. That'll be linked in the description. So if you need some more, more info and tips about that, please check that video out. It has some great, great resources. That's going to help you a lot in dosage calcs. Even though the metric system is discussed a lot more in our other video, like I said, that's going to be linked in the description, we are going to do a few practice problems together, and uh, we're going to be using milligrams and kilograms, and it, I thought it might be helpful to help visualize what these are if you're not familiar with it. Um, so let's look at a pineapple to help. A average size pineapple weighs about one kilogram, so if you see kilogram in your problem, you can think pineapple. Two kilograms, two pineapples, not so bad. If you cut one pineapple into 1,000 equal pieces, then each piece would weigh one gram. If you instead cut the pineapple up into one million equal pieces, then each piece would be one milligram. Very, very tiny. If you wanted to go real crazy and you wanted to cut it up into one billion pieces, each piece would weigh one microgram. So when you're seeing questions that involve milligram and microgram, you can visualize one millionth of a pineapple or one billionth of a pineapple. It's very, very small. And this is just here to help you visualize what this means. Like I said, we will talk a lot more about the metric system in the video that's linked in the description. So this next section of our workshop is going to talk about must-know math concepts. Um, a lot of dosage calculations are going to rely heavily on arithmetic, which is a branch of mathematics that deals with the study of numbers and using various operations on them. Operations here just means uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Uh, most of your addition, subtraction, multiplication, division are going to be done with a calculator, so you don't necessarily you know, need to do long strings of adding and multiplying by hand, but it, I, it is good to be comfortable with these concepts. Um, and speaking of uh, calculator, you'll want to make sure you do have a good calculator by your side. Um, all of these, all these concepts here go together. Operations and variables, gem dust and combining fractions, um, they all bleed into each other. Operations and variables are what you do with the numbers. Gem dust is the order in which you do things to numbers. And combining fractions um, are the rules we need to employ when using, when, when uh, working with fractions. And these all are important to know, not only if you're doing work by hand, but if you're using a calculator. So for more advice on what type of calculator you should use and how to use it, please check in with your instructor or a tutor from the SSC. So this is probably not new to you. Um, operations, variables, and formulas. We just talked about operations. Operations for our purposes just means adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing. Formulas, you've probably heard a bit about those before, and if you haven't, you will. And then variables typically is a letter or symbol used to represent an, represent an unknown quantity. We're going to do some problems later that use all of these. Before doing any math, either by hand or with a calculator, we need to make sure we're aware of the order of operations. Most calculators will follow the order of operations, and sometimes a student will get the math perfectly right on paper, like the formula is all good, beautiful, they plug it in the calculator and they get the wrong answer because they didn't quite type it in properly. Um, for more assistance with that, you can see a tutor, but just for now we're going to go over what the order of operations is, and it's represented by the phrase gemdus. The G stands for groupings, so the first thing that has to be done is any operations within parentheses or brackets. E is for exponents, which includes powers and roots. Those have to come up next. You won't see too much of the G and E in, d in dosage calcs. Most of it, like we talked about, is the basic operations, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. Um, and, and that's what the M and D stands for, multiplication, division, and A and S, addition, subtraction. Multiplication division take precedence over addition subtraction, so they have to be done first, and you work from left left to right. Uh, and the same thing for addition subtraction, they come last, but you work from left to right. If you'd like a little more information about gem dust and some examples on how it works, we have a link to the description, link in the description to a resource for that as well. So fractions will come up quite a bit in dosage calculations. Sometimes you're going to want to add or subtract them. Sometimes multiply and divide. Uh, let's just go over the rules for that so we know we're, we're prepared. If you want to add or subtract fractions, then they must have identical denominators, like, like these two. 
1 half plus 3 half, I can add those because they both have a denominator of 2. Carry that on over. 1 plus 3 is 4, and then you can simplify the fraction as needed. 4 divided by 2 is 2. So those ones I could add, no problem. Or I could have subtracted. Either way, they have the same denominator, so they can be combined with addition and subtraction. If they have different denominators, let's say we had 1 half and 3 sevenths, you'd have to find a common denominator. If you need some practice with that, we'll have a link in the description. We have a whole bunch of uh, resources linked in the description, including one for fractions. I will show you this one just because I have it up here, and I honestly don't know how to erase. Well, yes, I do, but I'm not going to erase. Um, so if I wanted to... The, the easiest way to find common denominators is to multiply each fraction by the opposite fraction, uh, the opposite fraction's denominator. So 7 over 7 is technically just 1, and 2 over 2 is technically just 1. But what's going to happen is these fractions are going to change. And I'm going to do 7 times 1 to get 7, 7 times 2 to get ooh, 14, and then over here, 3 times 2 is 6, 7 times 2. 14. They now both have the same denominator of 14. Now, now I can add them and carry the 14 on over. 7 plus 6. So this is how you want to uh, combine fractions that have different denominators. Look at that. I do know where my eraser is, which is good because I'm going to show you multiplying and dividing next. Uh, for adding and subtracting, the denominators do have to match. For multiplying and dividing, they do not, which makes life just a tiny bit simpler. So let's say you have these two fractions here, 2 over 3 times 1 over 2. Let's say you want to multiply these. You do not have to have them match. You literally just multiply the two top numbers together and the two bottom numbers together. Uh, you can either simplify first or you can simplify afterwards. It doesn't matter. Sometimes you don't even have to simplify. Um, this one I'm just going to do multiplication first and then simplify afterwards. So I'm going to do 2 times 1 over 3 times 2. And I get 2 6. 2 and 6 are both even numbers. They can both be divided by 2. 2 divided by 2 is 1. 6 divided by 2 is 3. So 2 thirds times 1 half is 1 third. If you would like to divide fractions instead, I don't know why I keep using a 2. Let's do that. Let's say you want to divide fractions. 2 7 divided by 1 4 you do skip, flip, and multiply. So you leave the first fraction alone, you skip it, you flip the second fraction over, and then you multiply. Let me make some room for myself. Thank goodness I found the eraser. Just wish it were a better eraser. Gosh darn, okay. What did I have? I don't even remember what I had. I'm making a new one. Good enough. Let's say we want one half divided by four sevenths. Is that what I had before? I won't know until I replay the video. Um, so we're gonna skip, leave it alone. We're gonna flip and change it to multiplication. And then once it's multiplication, it's the same as just any other multiplication problem. Multiply right across. One times seven, two times four, and there you go. So if you need to add or subtract fractions, denominators have to match. If you are multiplying or dividing, they do not have to match. You may not have to do too much of this, but because fractions do come up quite frequently, I just wanted to make sure that you were aware and comfortable with how to combine them when you need to. So this is something I wanted to touch on briefly. This may or may not be something you come across during the course of your studies. Uh, significant figures. So significant figures are the number of digits important to determine the accuracy and precision of a measurement, such as length, mass, or volume. And you'll be using mostly mass and volume. Uh, there are several rules used to determine if a digit is considered significant or not. We're not going to go through all those in this video, uh, but if you would like a much more thorough explanation of significant figures as well as some examples, please check out the corresponding resource linked in the description. And of course, you can always reach out to an SSE tutor. Okay, we are now almost ready to start looking at the practical problems, some, some practice questions we can do together. Here are some common problem types you may come across. Uh, solid oral medication, liquid oral medication, injectable medication, correct doses by weight, and then IV infusion and flow rates. We'll look at several of these uh, towards the end of the video. 
sure you're dying to get to the math part, actually getting the problems done, but this is all important, I promise. Before we can do any calculations, we need to keep some basic steps in mind. We talked about some basic study steps from earlier, you know, practice, get help when you need it, that kind of thing, but when you are actually doing the math, there are some basic steps you're going to want to keep in mind for each problem. So they are identify the crucial information, what it is that you have, what it is you're looking for, determine the problem type and the best method for solving. We'll talk about uh, different methods for solving in just a minute. Make sure units are consistent. This is a big one. Sometimes you're given milligrams and kilograms and you just want to make sure they match to keep your calculations uh, consistent. The next step would be solve, naturally. And then your final step that some people often overlook is check the validity of your answer. Uh, an example is if you're solving for the number of tablets you need to give a kid for something and you get an answer of negative 2,972, that's probably not a valid answer and something probably went wrong somewhere. So that last step is actually really important. Check the validity of the answer. They're all important steps, but that last one does get overlooked. So let's keep these basic steps in mind for the rest of the video. Now we're finally starting to get into the good stuff. Here are three problem solving methods commonly used in dosage calculations. Ratio and proportion, formula, and dimensional analysis. Let's use this problem here to examine how each of these three different methods, what they look like and how, and how they work. So the problem we're going to use is a provider orders lorazepam 4 milligrams IV push for a CWA score of 25. On hand, the clinicians have 2 milligrams per milliliter vials. How many milliliters are required to carry out the ordered dose? So we're going to do this problem three different times with these three different methods so you can see them all in action. Alright, so let's solve this problem with the ratio and proportion method first. So basically, a ratio is a fraction and proportions are two fractions that equal each other. So when I do this method, usually I start by making a fraction with the information about what I have on hand. And what we have on hand is 2 milligrams for every 1 milliliter. So 2 milligrams per milliliter this is what I have on hand. Let's put an equal sign in there to make this a proportion, and what I have ordered will be the other fraction. Now I have to make sure that this other fraction is set up in the same pattern as the first one. I chose to put milligrams in the numerator and milliliters in the denominator. I have to keep that pattern for this fraction. So looking at what I have ordered, I have four milligrams ordered. Put that there. But the milliliters is what I'm looking for, so I do not have that information. I'm just going to put an X right there. That's a variable. And to solve this, I'm going to use what is called, it's called cross-multiplying. Some people call it the butterfly method. And the reason they call it the butterfly method is because it makes, uh, makes butterfly wings. So let me show you. I'm going to multiply the top of the first fraction by the bottom of the second one. So 2 times X is 2X. And then I will multiply the bottom of the first fraction by the top of the second one. So which is 1 times 4, which is just 4. And then I will drop the equal sign down. So it's called the butterfly method because you kind of get the butterfly wings and the butterfly body right there. Uh, but technically, cross multiplying works as well. So I end up with the equation 2x equals 4, so 2 times some number equals 4. You can either do that in your head or you can use some algebra. If we divide both sides of this equation by 2, that cancels out the 2 with the x. Move it over here. So x is by itself, and the math I have to do is 4 divided by 2. 4 divided by 2 is 2, and remember we were looking for milliliters, so this must be 2 milliliters. So this is how you can use ratio and proportion to solve a problem. Let's go ahead and look at how you can solve that problem using a formula instead. First though, let's look at what some common formulas are. You're, you'll probably have notes of these, and if you don't, go ahead and make them. Um, so here are some common formulas. One is solid amount ordered divided by the solid amount on hand. You use this formula to find the number of tablets required. Um, another one is solid amount ordered divided by solid amount on hand times the volume on hand. You use this to find the liquid required. So look for liquid medications. We've got volume in milliliters divided by time in hours. This is how you find the flow rate in milliliters per hour. And then volume in milliliters 
divided by time in minutes times the drop factor, and this is how you find the flow rate um, in drops per minute. So keep these in mind. This is going to be super helpful, um, especially these little notes down here. Are you looking for tablets? Are you looking for liquid? Is it a flow rate? Keep those keywords in mind, and it might help you pick which formula is going to be the best one. Uh, so actually keep this in mind for for this problem we're going to do. We're going to do the same problem we just did. And we'll see if we can't pick up which one is going to be the best. Alright, so let's do this problem again. And we're going to try and use a formula. Remember the formulas that we just had. Hopefully you have some notes of those. Um, so let's see. What formula would work best for this? I'll reread the question. So provider orders lorazepam 4 milligrams IV push for a CV score of 25. On hand, the clinicians have 2 milligrams per milliliter vials. How many milliliters are required to carry out the ordered dose? So I'm not talking about a flow rate. They didn't ask for that. They didn't ask for tablets. It looks like we're going to use the ordered divided by half times the volume because we're dealing with a liquid medication here. So let's, let's check it out. Remember from those basic steps from earlier, make sure your units are consistent. And um, I don't know if I mentioned this in the last the last time when we were doing the ratio proportion. Um, I think I implied it, but I didn't state, state it specifically. But we've got milligrams and milligrams here, milliliters and milliliters, so there aren't any conversions that have to be done, which is good. So I can jump right into my formula of taking what I have ordered, dividing it by what I have on hand, and then multiplying it by the volume. Now the volume, there's no, there's no quantity here, so it's just one. Cancel out the milligrams. It's going to leave mill milliliters. I'm going to do four divided by two. Four divided by two is two. It becomes two times one milliliter. And two times one is just two. So it looks like we need two milliliters. We'll look at the same problem and we'll use dimensional analysis to solve it. Uh, to be honest, you probably wouldn't use dimensional analysis for this particular kind of problem. You can. Um, dimensional analysis uses a series of conversion factors. Uh, usually we use it to convert from one measurement to another. This problem is a little bit small and we don't have to do it that way, but you know what, we're gonna because it's, it's, it's a good example. So um, to do this, start the same way, read your question, make sure you know what you're looking for. Uh, dimensional analysis actually it looks a lot like ratio and proportion. Uh, just without the cool butterfly method going on there. But to set up a problem, write down what you need. We need milliliters. And then set up an equal sign. And what you're going to do is you're, you are going to actually set up some fractions, some, some ratios for yourself. In the numerator, make sure you put the unit that you need. So, like, we have, um, we have four milligrams ordered and we have two milligrams per milliliter. Milliliter is what I need. And so I'm going to take the information from right here, two milligrams per milliliter, and I'm actually going to write it the other way around. I need milliliter in the top because milliliter is the final answer I need. So it's, not going to be good. it's actually going to be milligram, sorry, milliliter over two milligrams. And I'm going to multiply that by the other information. The only other thing I have is four milligrams. And it's not a fraction, so I can just put it over 1 if I'd like to. Anytime you have a number that's not already a fraction, you can put it over 1. And the reason I needed milliliters in the numerator is so that way the milligrams could cancel, leaving just milliliters, which is what my answer needs to be. And so I end up with this. I end up with essentially milliliters times 4, or 4 milliliters, over, and just 2 times 1, which is just 2, 4 divided by 2, is 2 and milliliters is the unit I have left. So this is a small example of dimensional analysis. Uh, we have a couple more examples listed in the description uh, for some of the some of the bigger ones. But as you can see, this same problem can be answered three different ways. So the fact that we just solved the same problem three different ways it leads many students to the question, which one of these should I use? Many students wonder which of these methods is the best. And unfortunately, there is no one-size-fits-all method that would be the best in every scenario you encounter. The best two pieces of advice I have at this time are, one, as you're learning, talk with your teacher and ask them what tips they have. 
what they've used to help them solve problems most efficiently. Maybe they have some tips and tricks, like if you see, if you see this keyword, this method would probably be the most helpful and most, most beneficial. See, see what they have for you. They're more experienced. Uh, and two, strive to use the method that is the easiest for you. Errors in dosage calculations can cause severe consequences, so you want to avoid overcomplicating your computations. As you practice, if you find that one particular method is easier for you and you use the correct result, then feel free to stick to that. Okay, so by this point we've looked at some must-know math basics. We've looked at the three common ways to solve dosage calc problems. We've used those three different ways to solve the same problem. Uh, let's go ahead and do a couple of more problems uh, just for practice together. These are just a few random ones I've selected. If you would like more practice problems, please visit the SSC's website or visit a tutor. You can also ask your teacher. I'm sure they'd be happy to give you extra problems. Uh, so let's do this one. And there's a good chance, just warning you now, that I won't be, ab won't be able to pronounce uh, any of these medications or any of these, these, these drugs properly. So I'm probably not even going to try. And uh, this is a good example of something that I'm not going to try because I will get it wrong. So let's just say this medication. So this medication, 25 milligrams uh, by mouth is ordered. This medication is available as 50 milligram tablets. How many tablets would the nurse administer? So remember the steps or the things to keep in mind when solving a problem. You need to identify the crucial information. And one thing that's very crucial is my final answer should be tablets. And if you recall, although there are three different ways to solve problems, uh, three common ones, ratio and proportion, formula and dimensional analysis. We did have a list of very common formulas. Um, those are to come, come, in, uh, come in handy for these few practice problems. The one we had for tablets was really simple. It was ordered over half. You take what you have ordered and you divide it by what you have on hand. Going back though to those basic steps, we have to remember that the units need to match in order for these formulas to work properly. And it looks like they do. We have milligrams and milligrams, so no conversions are necessary for this one. So I'm going to take what was ordered 25 divided by what I have on hand, 50 per tablet. Milligrams will cancel. 25 divided by 50, you can go ahead and grab a calculator if you'd like to, but we should get 0 0.5, and tablet is what is left, and that is exactly what I needed. I needed my answer in tablets. It looks like that's a little clearer. It looks like uh, one half of a tablet would be administered. And I would sit back and think to myself, does that number make sense? Half a tablet? Sure, why not? And when I say does it make sense, I'm, I'm mostly looking for, you know, does is the, is the number ridiculously huge or ridiculously small or is it negative, you know? If you get any of those kinds of things, probably something went wrong in the calculations. Uh, but something like half of a tablet, that's perfectly reasonable. I've had that as a dosage before. And the more you work with these kinds of problems and you learn about these medications, and you learn how to pronounce them like I don't know how, um, you'll you'll become more and more familiar with what, with what is common and what answers seem like they're right. But for now, we'll just we'll just go with intuition, um, especially for me since I actually I don't like I said I don't know what this is. <laughs> Please feel free to tell me if you if you'd like what it is and what it's for. Or I guess I could Google it, but it'd be more fun to hear from one of you. So, but anyway, following our simple desired or ordered over half formula, we end up with half a tablet is needed. So let's try this problem again. Uh, there's no way in heck I'm going to pronounce that properly. So this drug, please feel free to tell me what it is. Uh, this drug, 0.1 grams, is ordered to be given through, I know that's not even a drug, but I still can't pronounce it, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so this drug is ordered 0.1 uh, grams. It's available as 30 milligrams per 5 milliliters. How much would the nurse administer? So this time we are dealing with liquid. We're dealing with milliliters. So we're going to have to use the ordered over have times the volume formula. Now you could, of course, solve this using ratio and proportion or dimensional analysis. I think I'm going to stick with the formulas for these because we have a list of those and they're the most straightforward. Like I said earlier, though, if you find a certain method works better for you, as long as it works, stick with it. Uh, but for these the examples, we'll use the formulas. So what was ordered? 0 0.1 grams. What do I have? 30 milligrams. 
So these are two different units. I need to convert. I need to make sure that they are in the same unit. So I'm going to have to convert from I'm going to convert from grams to milligrams. And like I said earlier, there is a video in, linked in the description all about the metric system that talks about how you can do these conversions nice and simply. To convert from grams to milligrams, you multiply by 1,000. So I'm going to take this 0 0.1. And multiply it by a thousand to switch it up into milligrams and that's going to get me 100 so 100 milligrams is what was ordered essentially I have 30 milligrams per 5 milliliters so I'm going to do 100 divided by 30 multiplied by 5 so let's see 100 divided by 30 I should have a calculator on the screen but I don't know how to do that so um, 100 divided by 30 is going to give us a repeating decimal, I believe. I highly encourage you to grab your calculator and do this along with me. We're going to get 3.3 .3 repeating, which is 3 and a third. That needs to get multiplied by 5, which is going to give us 16 and 2 thirds. So it looks like we need 16 and 2 thirds milliliters. Now, as far as rounding goes, you'll definitely want to check with your instructor. There are a couple of basic rounding rules that were listed on the SSC's dosage calc page. Um, if, you were, um, if your amount is greater than 1, you round to 1 decimal place, and if it's less than 1, you round to 2, but you can check with your teacher to make sure that that's still standard. Uh, if I do go by that rule, then this would round to 16.7 milliliters if I wanted to round to one decimal place. Ordered 19,000 milligrams of amoxicillin. Amoxicillin is available as 19 million micrograms per four milliliters. How much will the nurse draw up? I think amoxicillin is probably the one medication in this entire video I can pronounce. Um, so let's see. Okay, so we are looking for how much will the nurse drop? We're looking for a liquid amount. We're looking for volume. So we're probably going to use that ordered over have times volume formula. Before I do that, though, I do need to make sure my units match to make things work out well, and they don't. I have an order for milligrams, but what I have on hand is micrograms. So I need to convert. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and convert my milligrams to micrograms. Now, if I convert 19,000... 19,000 milligrams to micrograms, I'm going to get 19 million. If you're not sure how I did that, um, I, I know I didn't show on the screen, but please, 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 please check out the video in the description, the metric system video, because it shows you how to do conversions like this, and there's a nice printable cheat sheet for you that I highly suggest you have when you're working on these problems. Uh, but for now, we've done our, we've done a conversion. We've gone from the milligrams to micrograms, so now, now we have matching units. So I have an order for 19 million micrograms. On hand, I have 19 million micrograms. I'm going to spill over into the picture, and the volume is four milliliters. So micrograms will cancel out. 19 million divided by 19 million is just one, so it turns into one times four milliliters, which just tells me I need four milliliters. Again, you can check to see if your answer seems reasonable. We didn't get anything too ridiculous. I know it seemed ridiculous when we started because 19 million, oh my gosh, that's a big number. But after we did the math out and we, we followed the formula, we got four milliliters, and that sounds like a perfectly reasonable amount to me. Okay, let's see what we can do with this question. Medication that I can't pronounce. 1.5 milligrams per kilogram is ordered for a child weighing 45 pounds. This medication is available at 75 milligrams per 2 milliliters. How many milliliters must a nurse administer? So we're going to be looking for milliliters. Let's keep that in mind. I believe we can go ahead and use the formula, one of the formulas we talked about, the ordered over half times the volume of what we have. But first, we got to keep those those uh, math tips in mind. We, we need to make sure that the units are, are correct. And this looks like a dosage based on weight calculation. 
and they give us the weight of the child in pounds, but the dosage is referring to kilograms. So I need to first, before I can do anything else, before I should do anything else, take 45 pounds and convert it into kilograms. And usually to convert from pounds to kilograms, we divide by 2.2. So I'm going to off screen grab a calculator and do that. 45 divided by 2.2, and I get 20.5 if I round it to the nearest tenth. So that's how many kilograms. So if the child needs 1.5 milligrams per kilogram, then they need 1.5 times 20.5 for a total of 30.7 milligrams. So this is what we need. This is what was ordered. So that is going to be the start of my, my formula. 30.7 is what was ordered. Divided by what do we have? Looks like 75 milligrams. And they're both, this is milligrams and, and this is milligrams. The only unit I had to change was um, pounds to kilograms. So 30.7 milligrams is ordered. 75 is what's on hand. Multiply by the volume, which in this case is 2 milliliters. And we're going to end up with, well, again, I'm off screen with my calculator, 30.7 divided by 75 times 2, and I'm going to get 0 0.82 milliliters if I round that to the nearest hundredths. Ordered 318,000 microliters of normal saline IV to fuse in 8.9 hours by infusion pump. What is the IV flow rate in milliliters per hour? So we're looking for milliliters here, but we were not given milliliters, we were given microliters. So before I do anything using the formula uh, for, for flow rate, I need to take that 318,000 microliters, and I need to convert that to milliliters, that's what I need. And to go from microliter to milliliter, you divide by 1,000. And what's going to happen, you can grab a calculator and do this, but you can also just cancel out zeros. One, two, three, and you end up with 318 milliliters. So 318 milliliters must be infused over 8.9 hours. But they want it in milliliters per one hour, not per 8.9 hours. So I essentially just have to do 318 divided by 8.9. And again, off screen, I got myself a calculator here. There's probably an on screen way to do this, and I'm just <laughs> irritating everybody about not doing it, but it's a good way for you to follow along as well and make some notes. So, 318 divided by 8.9, and I get 35.7. And this would be milliliters per just one hour now instead of 8.9 hours. And that's what they wanted. What is the flow rate in milliliters per hour? Here it is, 35.7 milliliters per hour. Okay, so this will probably be the last problem we do in this video. It's already getting kind of long, but if you'd like some more practice problems, or if you have questions about the problems we did in this video and how they were solved, please feel free to visit the SSC online. You can visit us on campus. You can give us an email. You can also reach out to your instructor with any questions. Um, we're all here for you. So let's, let's do this problem. We're going to calculate the IV flow rate for 412 milliliters of normal saline to be infused in 3.5 hours. The infusion set is calibrated for a drop factor of 43 drops per milliliter. What is the IV flow rate in drops per minute? And I think this is one of the formulas we had. We had a formula for drops per minute where we took the volume, divided it by the time, and multiplied by the drop factor. But before I get ahead of myself, Remember, check on your units to make sure they're all correct. Um, I've got milliliters here, which is great. I need that um, because I, I was given a drop factor uh, with milliliters. But I have hours here, three and a half hours, and I'm looking for minutes. So I need to take three and a half hours. I need to multiply that by 60 since there are 60 minutes in an hour to figure out how many minutes there are. So. 3.5 times 60, and I'm going to do this off screen with a calculator. This is a pretty small calculation, and you, you could do it 
by hand or in your head. But like we said earlier, um, those calculations, if you get something wrong, it can cause some big problems, so there's no harm in using a calculator to double check your calculations. So we should get 3.5 times 60 is 210 minutes. So I should have all the information I need now. I have the volume, 412. It needs to be infused over uh, 210 minutes. And the drop factor is 43 uh, 43 drops per, per milliliter, not per milliliter. So let's go ahead and do 412. Again, off screen, I've got my calculator. 412 divided by 210. Multiply that by 43. And I end up with 84.361, yada, 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 yada. Now this is drops per minute, and you really can't, it doesn't make sense you'd have less than a drop per minute. I don't know how you would calculate to get 0.361 drops per minute, so we would probably round this just to 84 drops per minute. If this 3 had been 5 or above, we might bump this up to 85 drops per minute, but it would be much more reasonable to round this down to 84 drops per minute. Okay, so before I go ahead and wrap up this video, I just want to remind everybody of the resources we have at the SSC. A lot of them are going to be uh, linked in the description, but if you do go to the SSC's website and go to our dosage calc page, you'll see we have a lot of resources all nicely, nicely organized. We've got standard conversion factors, a couple of practice videos, we've got some common terms and symbols, uh, a little bit more about metric conversions, converting big to small, small to big. That's something that a lot of students print out and keep with them. There's that metric system video I've been talking about. Please watch that, unless you're already an expert in the metric system. And then we also have a few links to some other online resources where you can get some more practice questions, some examples. Um, we have a whole bunch of stuff out there to help you. If there's anything else that you need, please feel free to reach out to us at the SSC. We're here to help and wish you the best of luck.